walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall but you have never failed me yet waiting for change to come knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me still stands great is your faithfulness 
faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet you never fail me yet and I never will forget
was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. I said our God has Sing this with us. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Sing for thou, O Lord. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. Yes, you are. Thou, O Lord, art 
are good. You deserve our praise. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, folks. Good to see you today. Anybody here looking forward to Jesus' return? That's it? <laughs> In 2 Peter chapter 3, we find a very pointed reminder that the world that we know today is soon to be radically overhauled. <laughs> In fact, the world can scoff at this idea all they want. They can downplay it, they can make, it, make light of it, but Jesus is returning. In fact, God says in Numbers 23, 19, he says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I believe that he's going to fulfill this one, don't you? But on the day that Christ comes to judge this old world, it promises to be a day of fearful disaster for those who are not in Christ. He will come at a time when nobody will expect him. As Peter says in this chapter three, at a, at a time when he comes like a thief when the heavens are going to pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. And sadly, there will be many folks here in this world that are gonna be surprised, they're gonna be shocked, and maybe even angry by Jesus' return. We believers, we believers ought to be looking forward to that day with joy and anticipation. Amen? Somebody? <laughs> because when Jesus returns, the most precious words I want to hear him say are, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, in chapter 3, Peter's message, really the heart of it is in verses 14 and 15. And here's what he says. Friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. So if we are truly looking forward to that day, and we say, come Jesus, and then Peter gives us two things that we really need to be paying attention to until that day occurs. Two things that we really need to get locked down. Here's the first one. Every single one of us needs to be at peace with God. Every one of us. You know, the scriptures tell us that true peace only comes through a right relationship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. And see, when a person repents of their sin, they turn from sin and they turn from self, and then they turn to Christ in faith and trust for salvation, that person has all of their sins forgiven, and God will fill them with a peace an inexplicable peace that only comes from him. And Peter is saying, now take that peace and walk in it. But he says another thing here that we need to get a hold of, and that is make every effort. No, not, not in your strength, but in the strength that God alone can give you. Make every effort to live a life that's pleasing to him, keeping yourself spotless and blameless. In simple terms, that means don't let the world corrupt you in any of its ways. Pursue a life instead that's holy and righteous. 
it's interesting to note that Peter uses the words spotless and blameless here because in his previous letter, he uses those same two words to describe the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Spotless, blameless, holy, pure, without blemish. Does that describe your life today? As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, I urge you to take a moment right where you are and examine yourself. Ask yourself these two questions. First, am I truly at peace with God? Or am I struggling to find peace in my life? And secondly, ask yourself, am I truly walking in a way that is pleasing to Him? Or is there still something in my life that needs cleaned up? Something maybe I haven't turned over to Him fully yet. Or, or something that is keeping me from being right with Him. I urge you, just talk to Him. Let Him help. Let Him heal. Let Him work with you and in you. Listen to one last thing that the Lord tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. He says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Let me pray for you. Father, as we come together today to celebrate this communion that we have, let us always be mindful that we need to stay at peace with you and to walk in purity and holiness. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to come to terms with whatever we need to get right. And bless us today as we celebrate what your son Jesus did for us. And it's in his name we pray. Truth in advertising. You know, I, I think uh, sometimes uh, companies, individuals, they are clearly uh, consciously trying to deceive you. But I think oftentimes it's just kind of subconscious or <laughs> unconscious, really. I've got some real-life classified ads that actually appeared in print. Uh, listen to these. Are you illiterate? Write today for help. Alterations. This is an ad for an alteration shop. We do not tear your clothing with the machinery. We do it carefully by hand. How about this auto repair service? Try us once. You'll never go anywhere else again. Man wanted to work in dynamite factory. Must be willing to travel. Boom. Stock up and save. Limit one per customer. A girl wanted to assist magician in cutting off head illusion. Good salary and blue cross insurance provided. We will oil your sewing machine and adjust tension in your home for one dollar. Man, honest, will take anything. How about used cars? Why go anywhere else to be cheated? Come here first. <laughs> Sometimes I think in the church we unintentionally communicate Come to worship for one hour a week and we'll make you a spiritual giant. We really try hard not to do that here because I think to be spiritually healthy, it takes far more than an hour. And even more, it takes, it takes a mindset of not just being an observer, a spectator. It takes this commitment to be a participator. If you're too busy to grow spiritually, if you're too busy... To participate in the kingdom, you're too busy. The trouble is, we know, usually, if we're physically unhealthy, it becomes apparent quickly. And it doesn't take too long to figure out if we're mentally unhealthy or emotionally unhealthy. But sometimes spiritual sickness, a lack of spiritual health or growth, doesn't become apparent right away. It eats away at the inside of us. 
And I will say to you that God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to be spiritual giants. He wants us to spiritually grow. And he wants us to know that it, the body of Christ is for that purpose. You see, here we teach you about how to grow spiritually, vertically, your relationship with God. But I hope we clearly communicate to you that you need to invest in growing horizontally. You need to, to be vulnerable and open to be connected with other Christians. You need to understand it's not just about our corporate worship service three times on Sunday. But it's about how you walk with Christ, how you walk with other believers throughout the week that determines the effectiveness, it determines the power of your spiritual life. I want to talk today about the power of koinonia. Koinonia, you might know, was actually the winning word for the National Spelling Bee this year. The young man that won, he spelled koinonia. I think lots and lots of people, maybe even people who are Christians, were hearing that word koinonia and they were like, what? Koinonia is a very important word in the New Testament. It's mentioned 19 times. The first mention is in Acts 2, 42 to 47, we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> that word means fellowship. It means participation. It means communion. But it, it ultimately means together. It means sharing life together. Here's the problem. We, most of us grew up here in America. And America is a very individualistic culture. You think about it. Our movies are usually some version of the hero, the lone ranger, rides in and saves the day, and then he rides off alone. And I want to say to you, if you determine to live your life in Christ by yourself, that's where you'll stay, alone. The church is meant to be a body that is growing together. And let me say this. Uh, just as I tell you, uh, your ministry should not happen just within the walls of this church. You don't just serve here, but you serve where you work. You serve in your neighborhoods. You serve in your extended family. I say the same thing to you about involvement with other Christians. I hope that you'll be involved and share your life with other Christians within our body, but not just within our body. In fact, I think we should share life with other Christians. I know many of you have Bible studies with people that are not a part of this congregation. That's fine. The Big C Church is comprised of Christians all over this country and the world. We're just one small C congregation of the Big C. And I hope that you understand it's not just within our walls or within the Northside family that I'm encouraging you to share life. It's to share life with other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. But share life you need. Share life you must. I want to talk to you today about the power of small groups. The power of community. The power of koinonia. Here's the question. What is so powerful about small groups? Why do we need Small groups. Now, our small groups in our body take several forms. Uh, there are Bible studies that happen on Sunday morning, that happen on Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night, uh, Friday, or excuse me, Thursday afternoon. I mean, we, we have all kinds of Bible studies. We also have community groups. We're signing up for community groups the next three weeks. <clears throat> These meet outside of Sunday morning, usually in people's homes, but some meet here in the church. But these are structured ways to be connected with others. There are also one-on-one -on -one discipling relationships that different ones have. All of that is, it features the same thing. They are small groups. There are some things that can only happen in smaller groups of Christians that, that can't happen in this big uh, gathering that we call the worship service. It can't happen in the hour that we have together. What's so powerful about small groups? We're going to look at Acts 2, 42 to 47. The first thing it tells us is there's power to grow spiritually. There's power to grow spiritually. Verses 42 and 43. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is study of the word. 
you know, they devoted themselves. They didn't have the challenge that we do. Uh, <clears throat> they had the, the same, they had the oral history, but they had the Old Testament study. We study the Old Testament and New Testament, but they did the same thing. They tried to figure out what it meant to the original audience to put it in context and then to apply it to everyday life and to fellowship. You know, we are a restoration church, which means we want to be as much like the church of the first century as we can. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to koinonia, to the sharing of life together, to meeting together on Sunday for the Lord's Day and meeting together throughout the week, and to the breaking of bread, a euphemism for the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Everyone was filled at all at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So, they, as they gathered together, as they gathered together in the big group, and then they gathered together in little groups through the week, they were growing in power. They were growing in strength. They were spiritually on fire. You know, I used to think when I was younger, uh, like most young boys, I might be able to play in the NFL one day. Or the NBA. I mean, after all, I thought I could throw the ball pretty far. But it's only when you compete and, and come with others and play ball that you see that maybe you're not all that, right? I mean, did y'all see Friday night Pat Mahomes throw that ball 70 yards? I think, Chiefs fans, I think we got somebody that might do some stuff. I, I couldn't even hit a golf ball 70 yards. He throws the football 70 yards. But... I, I, I get off track. So here's the thing. How, do, how does he grow to that point? Some of it's God-given, but he has to, to train, doesn't he? He has to, to come alongside and practice those skills individually, and then, even more importantly, at, with others as a team. After all, it does you no good to throw the ball 50 yards or 70 yards if there's no one there to catch it. You think about this, how does that happen? It happens after years and years of training. The life of the early church was filled with koinonia. They were devoted to koinonia. Priority uh, was given to koinonia, the sharing of life. And because of that, they spiritually grew. Paul writes to young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales. Listen, rather train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. How do you train spiritually? You train by study. You train by prayer, but you train best together. Together. So, how can you do that? In these smaller groups, our groups always feature some form of Bible study. They feature praying. They feature discussion. Talking about how that it's understood, how it applies to both. And then any group, that's what can happen best in those smaller groups, but make no mistake, it's spiritual training that's going on. And so having the commitment to be a part of that first, it, it lays the groundwork for you to, to come alongside, for you to share life together, for you to grow in power spiritually. Second, what's so powerful about small groups? There's power to grow relationally. There's power to grow relationally. This is from verses 44 to 47a. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold, now listen to all the together words. Listen to all the plural in this. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. <laughs> they didn't just do that one hour a week. They were throughout their daily lives interacting with one another. 
They were throughout their daily lives building relationship. How good a marriage do you think you would have if you just met with your wife or your husband uh, from 1040 to 1140 every Sunday? Probably wouldn't be so hot or so healthy. Here, we have needs that are best met in smaller groups. Listen, I think it's important for us to gather for worship. I hope you're here as often as you can be, but that's just the beginning. It's about meeting in these smaller groups, sharing life together. It's about this growing of relationship, meeting needs that can only be met in those smaller groups. The first need is the need for accountability, the need for accountability. <clears throat> Here's the thing. If we do our Christian walk ourselves, sometimes it's more comfortable. But inevitably what happens is it's a lot easier to make excuses when it's just you. It's a lot easier to rationalize when it's just you, to give yourself a break. I also will tell you it is dangerous because you're much more vulnerable to temptation, to giving in to temptation. My guess is in a crowd this size, my guess is there are some of us with secrets because we've been walled off. We've been doing our Christian stuff ourselves, and we got habits that we wouldn't want anybody to know about. When you open yourself up to sharing life with other Christians, to being honest, to being transparent, to being vulnerable with other Christians, sharing life together, you meet the ultimate in your long-term best interest of the need for accountability. You meet and learn to, to train yourself to say no to temptation, to say yes to fellowship, to say yes to what is ultimately for your good. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. We all need accountability. We all need others that know our story. You know, from time to time I have people come, usually a male, and they come and talk to me about their struggle with pornography. And it's a tough world to live in if that's a temptation for you because it is so easily available. And inevitably I tell them, well first I say thanks for being open, sharing that with me. And then I say to them, there's some software that you can put on your computer or your phone that you put in the, the couple of email addresses of people that you trust that if you go to any site that's questionable, it'll send them an email showing what site you went to. You need accountability. You can't just trust yourself in that struggle with temptation. Listen, the reason you come alongside and be connected to other Christians is so they can help you be accountable. Second, we have a need for encouragement. A need for encouragement. A need for accountability is more not the help not doing what we're not supposed to do. And the need for encouragement is more for people to cheer us on when we're doing the things we should do. Uh, we, to, to help us say we're on the right track. To help us keep moving forward. To, to cheer us on. The need for encouragement you see in the early church. They met together and they were praising God together. and They were sharing with anyone who had need. They were encouraging one another. Hebrews 10.25 says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, Hebrews 10.25, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. John talked about the day of the community meditation, the day of the Lord. <clears throat> but while we're here every day, encourage. You know, in our groups, we see that. We see others wanting to grow spiritually. We see others prioritizing the meeting together, community groups, Bible studies, one-on-one -on -one discipling. And it, it is by nature an encouragement. Who of us don't need encouragement? I hope as you gather and worship here, I encourage you, but I can't speak specifically to each one of you. As you share life in smaller groups, you can do that. You can specifically encourage one another. 
Uh, third, our need for support is met best in small groups. Our need for support. What do I mean by that? This is when we come to those moments in life that are tough. Those moments in life that are trials or troubles, and they come for all of us. Maybe it's a struggle with the disease. Maybe it's a financial challenge. Maybe it's a relationship struggle, a bad breakup or divorce. In that time, we need others that we can lean on, others that can help us, others that can help us carry our burdens. Look what it says in Galatians 6, 2. Carry each other's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And there, it seems to be contradictory teachings, Galatians 6, 2, Galatians 6, 5. But they're not when you understand the Greek. Uh, when it says carry each other's burdens, it's talking about a huge crushing load. Let's say 200 pounds, 250 pounds. How many of you can carry that by yourself? In 6, 5 it says, but everyone needs to, to carry their own burden. Unfortunately, oftentimes the same English word is used, but that's more of a, a backpack type load. So you, you do your part, you, you walk and, and do your thing in normal times, but, but when you have something big happen, you lose someone close to you who dies. You have a financial setback. You have a relationship struggle. Then you come alongside and the people of God, your brothers and sisters, can come alongside you and support you. All of us need support. Here's the thing. It is easy to just do your own thing. And maybe in the short term, it seems pleasurable to be the Lone Ranger. Certainly a lot less awkward and uncomfortable. But ultimately, we all need support. We all need help. We all need others sometime. And in these groups, in that relation, that growth, that hot house, that garden of relationships that is a smaller group of Christ's followers, then you develop a mutually supportive network. In the small groups I've been involved with through the years, I've seen this happen over and over. Sometimes we had a different lesson plan, and someone was really having a tough time with something, and we just spent the time talking about that and praying over that person. Listen, we need that. I'm going to tell you, the only thing limiting our groups is the number of leaders, the number of teachers. We must grow smaller as we grow bigger. Last Sunday, we had almost 800 people here. And we have 25 groups right now. In Idaho, there's a church, real life church. We teach a discipleship class here called Real Life Discipleship. It, it, based on what they did there, they have 8,000 or so people. They have 1,200 small groups. How are we going to do that? How are we going to meet the need for accountability, encouragement, and support? We need more leaders. We need others to come alongside and provide those places for folks to share life together. Why? Because finally, the power in small groups is the power to grow numerically. As more and more people become to Christ, more and more places to grow and meet their needs those specific needs, more and more places to train, the spiritual gems, the small groups or spiritual gems that we need. Acts 2.47, the last part of it says that. It tells us that the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. They come because of the power of the gospel. But what is it we'll do with them then? We are committed here to living life with Christ 365 days a week. We have some very specific ways for you to get involved, to step out of your comfort zone these coming days. But will you? Will you? Seattle, they had a Special Olympics race. Now, I have a son with special needs, and so I've been to Special Olympics. It's always encouraging, but this was a even more amazing day 
It was the start of the 100-meter dash. There were nine athletes, some with mental disabilities, some with physical disabilities, some with both, that lined up across the line. They were all stretching, and they were all exciting. The, the gun went off, and they started out, not exactly in a dash, but with a relish to run the race to the finish and win. They are just like us. They wanted to win. Except, in this race, one of the boys fell and rolled a couple times and started to cry loudly. Others who were running ahead, they could hear him because he was so loud. And one by one, they stopped. And they turned around. And all of them began to walk back toward him. One girl with Down syndrome bent down and kissed him and said, this will make it better. Then they helped him up in all nine linked arms and walked together to the finish line. And everybody in the stadium stood up and cheered for over 10 minutes. <clears throat> Not sure why we call them people with special needs. Because I spent a lot of time, and almost all of the people we call those with special needs are very much aware that they need one another. They need other people. They'll give to other people. They'll love other people. I don't see too many arrogant special needs folks. I don't see too many individualistic special needs folks. Maybe it's us, normal people who have special needs. So I have this question. I think God wants me to ask this question. Can you step out of your comfort zone? Will you be more vulnerable? Maybe it is to lead or to teach. If you are willing, we can help you. We can train you in how to be a Bible teacher. We have a class in that this fall. Or Steve and I can help you with that. Maybe you've never participated in one of our Bible studies or, or community groups. Why not? Will you try? Because I'm telling you, if you want to grow spiritually, if you want to be a spiritual giant with all the blessings that come alongside, you need to change the cycle. You need to try something different. You need to extend yourself more. You need to get out of your comfort zone. I think you'll be glad you did. There's a power in koinonia that is unimaginable until you start to experience it, until you open yourself up to it. Fathers, we think about these things today. I pray for... Uh, for open ears and open hearts. As you've spoken to us, help us to respond. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's ministry time. We uh, think the, the life of Christ, the life of the church doesn't happen until we give our life to Christ. We become a Christian, a Christ follower. Maybe there's one or more here who want to become a Christian today. We can help you with that. Maybe you want to join us here as formal members of our Little C congregation of the Big C Church here at Northside, we can help you with that. But I think the, the directed challenge and invitation today is to really think about how much you, you allow yourself to be open, how much you prioritize being connected with other Christians, other believers. And I hope you leave here committed to being more social, more connected, more sharing life with other Christians than you were when you walked in. Let's stand. If you have a decision, please come.
Amen. Amen. All right, have a seat. We have something special to be a part of. accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'd like to pray for you guys real quick. Father, we just thank you for this day, this opportunity you've come here, with, to come here together collectively and, and give a new worship and, and to get to see these three get baptized today and and get to give you glory. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep Satan at bay as, as they have professed their faith to everyone here today, Lord, that he's going to be trying to knock them down. And I ask that you'd give them the strength, Lord, to endure the things that he throws at them, that they would put on that armor of God and be strong in your might and not their own. Father, we thank you and love you. In your precious son's name we pray. They made the realization that Christ is enough for them. This morning, maybe you've been kicking around that. Let's sing this one more time. And uh, we want to make sure you know that's Dan, Melissa, and Kirk Kilman that were baptized. And it, as Bo said, my son was the one that baptized Kirk. Uh, you see a visual illustration of what I'm talking about, how 
Each of them had people in their lives that had helped them grow spiritually, that had invested in them and connected with them, and, uh, and they then chose them. I, I love baptizing people, but it doesn't take an ordained minister to make a difference in your life or you to make a difference in the lives of others. All of us are ministers. All of us have the capacity to invest in others. And that's what it's about. I want to tell you, too, in the middle service, uh, we had Amy McCartney join us about transfer. We also had a family, Denny and Michelle Hoskins, and their three kids join us about transfer. So nine folks have come and said, we want to be a part of the Big C Church and a part of this little congregation called Northside, and uh, we're excited about that. The community group sign-ups, uh, Bible studies, there's announcements about those in the bulletins. Go by the Connection Center on this side next to the coffee bar or all the community group sign-ups. And especially if you're willing to try to be a teacher or leader, we can help you with that if you're willing to try it. Uh, we have that class coming up. Uh, Stephen and I can help you. Uh, we can give you the tools if you're willing to try and step forward and, and teach or lead. So we'll help you with that and look forward to that. I also want to tell you, middle schoolers, uh, our parents of middle schoolers, we have our program Fuel starting this Wednesday changing it a little bit. It's going to be Wednesday nights now from 6 to 7.30, and that starts this Wednesday, and so please know that. What a great day to be here together. I'm going to pray for us, and I hope you have a great week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your goodness. I thank you that we don't have to walk the road alone, and that uh, even though our nature and our culture is about being an individual, we can have that overcome by brothers and sisters coming close to us, us coming close to them. Help us to grow out of our comfort zone. Help us to be more open. Help us to be more invested in connecting with other believers. I look forward to seeing you work. You continue to work in this body. I thank you for the baptisms. I thank you for the, the transfers to the other. I thank you, Father, that all of us are on this road. Help us to walk it straight and true this week. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have a great week.